Welcome to the SDE Professional Development, Teaching Through Difficult Situations, brought to you by Kayamishi Tech's Workforce and Economic Development. In this video, we will cover Controlling Emotions Teaching a Defiant Child Teaching Emotional Intelligence Teaching an Impoverished Child Teaching Children with Incarcerated Parents Teaching Children Going Through Grief Teaching a Defiant Child When children are defiant, their goal is not to annoy, disrespect, or frustrate us. Rather, their goal often is to feel significant. Yet their defiance threatens our own similar need. As we both strive to feel significant, we can easily get enmeshed in a power struggle. The best way to avoid power struggles and help a child who defies authority is to calmly work with him in ways that honor their genuine need to feel significant. Also critical is demonstrating that you still hold him and everyone in the class accountable for following the rules. And of course it's best to help the child avoid defiance mode in the first place. Preventing defiance. The more you proactively give children constructive ways to experience personal power, the more cooperative they'll be. Here are some proactive steps to try. Build a positive teacher-student relationship. Although this advice applies to all students, it's crucial for students who tend to act defiantly. These children need to feel that despite any difficulties, you'll still care about them, recognize their successes, and actively include them in the classroom community. To build strong relationships, remind yourself that all children, including those who frustrate you, have positive attributes. Make a point of learning about your students' interests and channel their talents in ways that foster their sense of significance. For example, a child who's good with their hands could be called on to fix stuck door latches or other small mechanical problems in the classroom. Reinforce progress and effort. All children, but especially those who struggle with defiance, need to hear when they're doing well and where they're improving. Make a point of noticing the child's successes, big and small, in following directions, transitioning smoothly, or doing anything that ordinarily might invite resistance. Reinforce the behavior by letting the child know you noticed, but do it privately to avoid calling attention to the child and inviting comparisons with classmates, and be specific. Whenever possible, also note how the cooperative behavior helps the child and others. For example, when you get in line quickly, everyone has more time for recess, or when you helped Kevin this morning, I think they felt valued. You were living out our rule to take care of each other. To avoid suggesting that pleasing you is what's most important, steer clear of phrases such as, I like, I want, and, I appreciate, when reinforcing positive behavior. A child who's sensitive to being told what to do may feel manipulated by IA statements. Teach how to disagree respectfully. It's empowering for all children, especially those who struggle with authority, to know that they may disagree with adults. Of course, allowing students to disagree doesn't mean accepting all forms of disagreement. Part of becoming a contributing member of a democratic society is learning how to disagree respectfully. When teaching children appropriate ways to disagree, make clear that in the moment, they still need to follow directions and rules. Let them know that later they can discuss what they think was unfair and what should be changed. Teach children safe and respectful ways to show their disagreement, such as using respectful words and phrases like, I feel that, and I suggest, or writing a letter to you or dropping a note into a complaint box. Be sure to model these methods before expecting children to use them. Channel children's energy in positive directions. Children who challenge authority are often quite adept at taking on bigger causes. Working on issues they consider important can help focus their energy and build their sense of significance. Offer assignments such as writing letters to the school or town paper, community service projects, or researching an environmental issue. De-escalating defiance. Avoid doing anything that will heighten the child's stress and invite more resistance. Simply put, don't push their buttons. Don't try to reason or make an emotional appeal to win the child over. While in the midst of defiance, they will likely be unable to respond to you in a positive way. Slow down. Waiting a few seconds, if safety allows, 
Before you say or do anything lets the child regain their ability to cooperate and also lets you assess the situation calmly and objectively. After an incident, reflect on what preceded it. Eventually, you'll begin to recognize the situations that set off the child's defiance, such as unexpected schedule changes, as well as the signs that they's becoming uncomfortable, such as opening and closing their fists or avoiding eye contact. Getting past defiance. Intervene early, with a respectful reminder or redirection. When you first see signs that a child may become defiant, respond as soon as you can with respectful reminders or redirections. If you wait until a child has dug in their heels, they will likely be less able to respond rationally to your directions. Students who have difficulty cooperating can be especially sensitive to being ordered around. Remember to Be brief Avoid lectures and sarcasm. Speak calmly and matter-of-factly. Use short, direct statements. Avoid questions, unless you will accept any answer. Keep your body language neutral. For example, to a child who's challenging directions by standing up and yelling, you might quietly say, Andre, take a seat. You can read or draw for now. When using consequences, offer limited choices. Once a child has become defiant, you may decide to use consequences. Remember, though, that children who struggle with defiance are often seeking power. Offering a choice between a couple of consequences, instead of giving a who do this order, lets the child hold on to their sense of significance and dignity and teaches their, and the class, that they are still being held accountable for their behavior. For example, when Anna refuses to move during a transition, you might say, Anna, either you can come with us now, or I can have. Name colleague, come sit with you. Which do you choose? Avoid negotiating in the moment. Once a child has defied you, decide on a redirection or consequence and remain firm in your decision. Negotiating during the incident will invite further testing. It also sends the message that children can avoid a redirection or consequence by resisting. If you do find yourself in a power struggle, take a deep breath and disengage. Let the child, and the whole class, if watching, know that you're finished talking for now and will address the issue after the child calms down. For instance, Max, we're done talking about that for now. Everyone, get your writing journals out and start on your stories from yesterday. Give the child time and space. Once you've given a reminder, redirection, or consequence, be sure the child follows it but physically step back to give him more space, literally and emotionally. Doing so lessens the sense that you're trying to control him. But don't expect immediate compliance. A child who struggles to follow directions often needs a minute or two to decide what to do. If you insist on immediacy, they may automatically resist. Steps to teaching an impoverished child. 1. Have high expectations. When you have students who are living in poverty, compassion is important. But, it does students an injustice if you do not hold them to high expectations. As educators, we want our students to do their best and succeed in our class and life. Holding students to high expectations allows them to work toward reachable goals that can empower them with intrinsic motivation. This is important because once a student leaves your class, hopefully, you have instilled in them the power to work hard toward their goals and rise to the occasion. Here are four ideas to try. Give students the opportunity to set goals. Then, coach them to achieve their goals. Hold students accountable for classroom expectations. Have conversations about why they are important to follow. Expect the best out of students when it comes to their work. Be a role model. Share your goals and high expectations for yourself with your students. 2. Expose students to places outside of the classroom. Many times students' experiences can be limited due to their means and their parents caregivers' experiences. It is integral to show students the world around them and open their eyes to what the world has to offer. Here are four ideas to try. Teach students about different career options, arts-related or not. Bring in artists and other career professionals to speak to your class. 
get students off school grounds and take a field trip to a local museum. Use the web to take a virtual field trip through museum websites or videos. Finally, be sure to connect learning in the classroom to real life experiences. This will truly enhance your students' perspective as they learn and move through life. 3. Build relationships with your students and their families. Building relationships is a key aspect when it comes to a creating a positive learning environment. It also helps foster mutual respect and trust with your students and their families. One factor those living in poverty often face is high mobility due to unstable living situations. Be a source of consistency. Let your students and families know they can trust you and make them feel welcome. 4. Teach them social-emotional learning strategies. Students who live in poverty can have trouble focusing in school because of things troubling them in their personal lives. It's important to teach positive social and emotional skills that can build trust, respect, community, and personal growth. These skills can also help students learn to regulate their feelings and transition to a mindset ready for learning. Let's take a look at three ideas. Breathing techniques. A great way to teach students how to regulate their emotions is to take a step back and do some breathing techniques. If your school does not already teach breathing techniques, you can easily do this in your classroom. 3 Strategies to Try Beach Ball Have students pretend they are holding an imaginary beach ball. When they inhale they pretend the ball is expanding. While they exhale they pretend the ball is squeezing inward. Square This breathing technique simply has students take their finger and trace a square in front of them in the air. As students make the first line for the top of the square, they inhale. As students make the second line of the square going down, they exhale and so on. You can repeat this as many times as you want. Bunny breath. This is a great breathing strategy, especially for your youngest students. Have your students pretend to be rabbits. They will need to take three quick sniffs in the nose and one long exhale out the nose. Calm Down Corner A calm down corner is a space in your classroom that allows students who are not regulated or in the proper mindset to begin learning to go and regulate themselves. You can have students use a stress ball, glitter bottles, or breathing techniques to begin to calm down. You may also want to have a self-reflection sheet available to help students process their feelings. Classroom Circles One way to build community is through classroom circles. This technique involves students getting in a circle and sharing based on a prompt given by the teacher. Here is how it works. Students get in a circle with the teacher. Ground rules should be shared to promote trust, respect, and honesty. The teacher shares a prompt for students to answer. The only person talking must hold a talking piece. This practice allows each student to have a turn without interruption. When everyone who wants to speak has spoken, the teacher can close the circle and thank the students for sharing. In general ed circles, sometimes this technique is practiced daily. However, if you are a teacher who doesn't see your students every day, you could try implementing it once or twice a month. 5. Create a positive classroom culture. Making sure you have a classroom that exudes positivity and community is important. Be sure to teach your students to be compassionate and respectful toward one another. It can be helpful to have specific conversations about not judging others, especially on outward appearances. Team building exercises, modeling kindness, having mutual respect, and sharing the importance of accepting others are great ways to make this happen in your classroom. Overall, students living in poverty are just like other children, but they can encounter limitations and barriers that make it harder to learn. We must do our best to make sure each child knows how special they are and that no matter what problems they may face, there is someone who loves and believes in them. The term at risk implies that a student faces factors related to the school, society, and family that increase the likelihood of struggling in school, requiring remediation or facing retention and decrease the likelihood of becoming a high school graduate. Mobility is a common experience found with other at-risk factors, such as high poverty, homelessness, 
placement in foster care, or being a child of migrant workers. In fact, one correlate of student achievement is student mobility. Changing schools frequently is associated with lower academic achievement, decreased access to the full curriculum, and, ultimately, dropping out of school. While there are varying definitions of highly mobile, with some researchers suggesting students who change schools more than six times in their K-12 career and others positing that more than one move per year should be considered highly mobile, many of our highly mobile students far exceed such rates with multiple moves in any given year. Depending on the reasons for moving frequently, highly mobile students can be among those at highest risk for school failure. Consider the following statistics. According to the 2000 Census Report, 15 to 18 percent of school-aged children changed residence from the previous year, and nearly 12 million children changed their place of residence from 1999 to 2000. Poor families move 50 percent to 100 percent more often than non-poor families. One half million children attended more than three schools between first and third grade according to a 1994 U.S. General Accounting Office report. Approximately 30% of children in low-income families change schools annually versus 8% of children well above poverty. In urban schools, the turnover rate for students ranges between 40% and 80% each year. Frequent school changes have been correlated with lower academic achievement qualities of effective teachers of highly mobile or homeless children. Teacher background characteristics. Effective teachers have knowledge of the content they teach and the pedagogical knowledge needed to teach their specific students and content. Teacher as a person. Effective teachers are caring individuals who understand the needs of their students and take the time to get to know their students and their families. They are enthusiastic about learning and convey that enthusiasm to their students. Classroom Management and Organization Effective teachers create a positive learning environment and ensure that the physical environment of the classroom supports rather than detracts from learning. Planning and Organizing for Instruction Effective teachers plan lessons based on important concepts and skills that students need in order to be successful. They use appropriate resources and convey high expectations through meaningful content, rather than focusing on isolated facts. Instructional Delivery Effective teachers deliver high-quality instruction through the utilization of myriad instructional approaches to meet the needs of their students. Monitoring Student Progress and Potential Effective teachers monitor student learning, provide feedback to students and make adjustment to instruction in order to maximize learning. Thank Understanding you for taking the needs our of online children safety with incarcerated class. parents. According to a 2012 report from the Sentencing Project, 744,200 fathers were in prison. Between 1991 and 2007, the number of fathers in prison increased by 76%. 65,600 mothers were in prison. Between 1991 and 2007, the number of mothers in prison increased by 122%. The majority of parents in state, 62%, and federal, 84%, prisons were incarcerated more than 100 miles from their last residence. Racial disparities in mass incarceration of adults also affect their children. The rates of children with incarcerated parents were 1 in 15 black children, 1 in 42 Latino children. 1 in 111 steps to creating an inclusive culture for children with incarcerated parents. Step 1. Train all school staff members to build competence related to serving families with incarcerated parents. Step 2. Inform all families that school staff had training via a letter or email from the school. Step 3. Let the community know that the school is interested in better serving this population by asking for volunteers to develop an advisory council of caregivers, people with lived experiences, and adults or young adults in the community with a formerly incarcerated parent. Step 4. Gather community resources for supporting families in the carceral system. Make a list of local programs, summer camps, social services and transportation to local prisons and jails. Step 5. 
advertise the school's resources in the hallway and display posters or signage that offer support for students with incarcerated parents. Step 6. Maintain a support group specific to kids affected by incarceration. Thank you for taking our online professional development.